All right, welcome to the 9 o'clock service that feels like the 8 o'clock service. Amen, everybody? I don't know if you're aware of this, but those that come to this service once a year receive a special blessing from the Lord that all of the sleepyheads don't get. You have postured yourself to be blessed today because you came early expecting God to move. And he has moved, amen? Amen. He may not move like this at the 1045. This may be specially for you because you got up early. Huh? Grab your Bible and turn to Acts chapter 19. Who has your Bible? Say me. Who's got a paper Bible? I see a lot of paper Bibles. I like paper Bibles. Pastor, why are you so against a digital Bible? I'm not against digital Bibles. They're a good secondary source of Scripture. I will make you aware that some digital forms of Bible are changing. Certain words being taken out, certain sentences being taken out. Don't be surprised if in the days ahead, digital forms of Scripture, digital forms of information, digital forms of history get altered. Paper is pretty important. No, I do not have stock in a paper company. But you should just be aware that things are changing or trying to be changed. I want to continue our conversation today on discipleship and establishing foundations. We've been in Hebrews chapter 6. I know I told you to go to Acts chapter 19. We'll get there in a minute. But Hebrews chapter 6 says the following. It says, therefore, leave the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ. Does anybody want to stay elementary? Is anybody's heart's desire to remain in the elementary? I don't think any of us accept Christ and then you say, you know what, I just want to be a baby Christian for the rest of my life. It's not like that's our spoken it's our spoken desire, but, but often without intentionality, you can remain in a state if you're not careful, and that's what he's speaking into. So he says, therefore, leave. Therefore, it's upon you to leave it. It's upon you to leave it behind. It doesn't actually happen. Leave the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ. Let us go on to perfection. Some translations say maturity. Not laying again the foundations of Repentance from dead works, faith toward God, doctrine of baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and the doctrine of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. What will we do if God permits? We'll go into maturity. First sentence. Let us leave the discussion of the elementary principles and go on to maturity. This we'll do if God permits. So are there those that God will not permit to go on to maturity? Yes, those that don't have these doctrines. So this is pretty, pretty important. These six things are pretty important. So as on this topic of discipleship, how can I grow in the faith? How can I posture myself for the more of God? How can I go on to the greater things that God has for me? Do you believe that there are greater things that God has for you? Yes or no? All right, so how can I go on to those things? You've got to make sure that these are established in your life. We talked about repentance. We've talked about faith toward God. We've talked about this idea of dying daily to self and pursuing the, the resurrected things that God wants to bring forth in my life daily. We talked about that last week. And this passage now brings to our attention that there is a doctrine of baptisms, plural. It's plural in the Greek. It's plural in English. That means that there's more than one of them. A lot of Christians believe, well, there's just one baptism you need when you, get, when, you, when you become a believer in Christ. Actually, there's many baptisms, and we're going to talk about three of them today. These are the three most spoken of baptisms. So we're going to talk about diving into, being immersed into all three of these baptisms. And we're just going to, we're just going to jump right in to the baptisms. We have a swimming pool at our house, and um, all of my kids have their signature moves off of the diving board. I got a good diver, I've got a, I got a good jackknifer, and I got one, her specialty is cannonball. Everybody say cannonball. Now the thing about the cannonball is it doesn't take a lot of form. Anybody can pretty much, if, if you can reach your knees and hold your arms around your knee, you can do a cannonball. And the thing about a cannonball is the purpose of a cannonball is not just to get wet. The purpose of a cannonball is to get everybody else wet. 
who's around you. If you do a good cannonball, you're not the only person that gets wet. Mama laying out gets wet too, which makes her really, really happy. So the title of today's message is Cannonball. We're going to do a cannonball. This is, this, is, this is, I think, a picture of what God wants all believers to do. Not just to do a toothpick in, not just to ease in, but to say, cannonball, here I come. I want all three of these baptisms, not just so that I can get wet, so that everybody around me can too. Amen. All right. I thought you'd like that. All right, so let's look at um, these three baptisms. I want to give you... You know, you can take note of them. You may be aware of them. The first baptism is what Scripture calls the baptism in Christ, a baptism in Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13 is a reference where we see this baptism. It says, we're all baptized by the Spirit into one body, which is Christ. So by the Holy Spirit, you were baptized into Jesus. Galatians 3 Gives us a broader picture of this. You are all sons and daughters of God through faith, through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you were baptized into Christ and you have now clothed yourself with Christ. So this is talking about salvation. But it mentions it as a baptism. The picture that is painted, this is a baptism. You are baptized into the person of Jesus. Holy Spirit prompts you to move in the direction of Christ through faith. So it is Holy Spirit that opens your eyes. It is Holy Spirit that convicts. It is Holy Spirit that draws you. And then once your heart says yes to Jesus, you are baptized by the Spirit of God into Christ himself. So this baptism, the one doing the work, is Holy Spirit who baptizes you into Jesus. This is, this is what happens at salvation. John 6, 44 says that it is the Spirit of God that draws us unto salvation. And then once you hear this truth, it is the Spirit of God that baptizes you into Christ himself. So salvation is a baptism. The next thing that happens is the baptism of water. The baptism of water. I think we get this one, Matthew 28, 19, kind of mentions this baptism in the form of after the nations are reached and we're making disciples, one of the things is to baptize them into the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Some people actually see all three baptisms right here in the Great Commission. A baptism into Christ, a baptism of the um, water, and a baptism in Holy Spirit, in which we'll talk about in a minute. So after we get saved, this baptism, this water baptism, not only baptizes us um, in water, but it also baptizes us into a body. So it it is a declaration, a public declaration of faith but it is also a declaration is, I'm going to be committed unto my other brothers and sisters. I am baptizing myself into a fellowship of believers. Does this make sense? So that's why people ask the question, well, can I do this not in public? I don't like getting you know, wet in public. I don't want you know, I don't, I don't to do this in public. Can I, can I get baptized in my shower? No, 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 you can't. Can I get baptized in my own bathtub? No, you, you, no, you can't. You can't. You get baptized in public because you're making a public profession of faith. Now, you have one of us over your house, and we all get in your bathroom, and you fill up your tub. It's weird, but we'll do it, all right? You understand this? Okay. All right, so this is a public profession of faith. Now, a lot of people say, well, I don't need this in order to be saved. No, you don't. You just need to be baptized into Christ to be saved. That's all you need. But if you want to go on to maturity, huh? This is a discussion about maturity, not just getting to heaven. If you want to be mature, this baptism is necessary. Absolutely necessary. Why would we not want to do what Jesus modeled himself? Jesus modeled for us that this baptism was absolutely essential in order to do what he has called us to do. And he has not just called you to go to heaven. So it's vital. It's vital, and it's a, it's a baptism that everybody needs. There are, is also something very spiritual and something very dynamic that this baptism does. It opens up doors for you to inherit and receive future things. It's very spiritual. God inhabits the water. He moves powerfully. I have seen with my very eyes God do all three baptisms in the water. 
a baptism into Christ, a baptism of water, and a baptism of the Holy Spirit in that moment. I've seen it. Okay? So all of these baptisms, there's not a certain order per se. Some, let's just be honest. Some people get baptized with water before they ever accept Jesus. They were at youth camp and everybody else got in the ocean. It looked pretty cool. It's going to look good on Instagram. Go ahead and grab this baptism right now so I can post about it. And they had no intent. I'm just being dead serious. They had no intent on ever following Jesus. The last is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay, baptism in Holy Spirit, of Holy Spirit, is an elementary doctrine. Now, we, we focus a lot on baptism of salvation, baptism of water, but in the Protestant faith, we focus very little on baptism of the Holy Spirit. Outside of Charismatics and Pentecostals who talk about it every week. <laughs> Anybody grow up in one of those churches? All right, good. Praise God. Run a lap. All right. (laughs) Outside of those streams, if you will, baptism of the Holy Spirit in the Protestant faith is is talked about very, very infrequently. But yet, Scripture talks about it more than the other two combined. Than the other two combined. Okay? So it's an elementary doctrine. Look at Luke chapter um, 3. We'll get to Acts in a minute. Don't, 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 don't get worried. But in Luke chapter 3, look at, what, look at what John the Baptist says. here. John, John answered them all and said, I baptize you with water for repentance. But one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Some people say he's talking about salvation. He's not talking about salvation. He's talking about exactly what he said. He's talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, this this verse, I want you to look here. It is Jesus who is doing the baptizing. He is the baptizer. So in this baptism of the Holy Spirit, in the baptism of salvation, it is Holy Spirit that baptizes you into Jesus. At the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it is Jesus who returns the favor and baptizes you in Holy Spirit. He is the baptizer. He is the subject. He is doing the immersing. And Scripture is very clear that there is this subsequent experience of Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit at salvation seals your heart. He seals your heart. For heaven. He seals your heart for salvation. But this work is an immersion of. This is, this is a total immersion of. This is a resting upon that God offers for believers. And apparently, it's pretty important. Why do we think it's pretty important? Because in the scriptures, we see an urgency of the first century apostles, teachers, and leaders to get people baptized in the Spirit. Do you find Acts chapter 19? All right, look at it real quick. Let me show you some of these because Acts chapter 19, Acts chapter 8, um, over and over again throughout the scriptures, again, we see this urgency. Look in Acts 19 verse 1, it says, while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul took a route through the interior and came to Ephesus where he found some disciples. Notice that they are already disciples. They were followers of Jesus. And he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you came to believe? This is how we started the conversation. This is how we should start conversations. When you see somebody at the grocery store, hey, good to see you. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you came to believe? Man, I'm just here trying to get eggs. And you're going all deep on me, right? Yeah, yeah, but I just need to make sure that you received the Holy Spirit when you believed. And they look at him, I love the response, and they replied, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. They grew up Baptist. (laughs) <laughs> they grew up Methodist. They grew up in a church where Holy Spirit was figurative. He's already done all his work. He's done. He's sitting down next to Jesus. And they answered, 
Then he answered, well, if you didn't receive that baptism, let's just go back to the drawing board. Which ones did you receive? They said, John's baptism. He said, ah, okay. John's baptism was a baptism in which people showed that they were changing their hearts and their lives. This is a baptism of repentance. It was a baptism that told people about the one who was coming after him. This is the one in whom they were to believe. This one is Jesus. After they listened to Paul, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, so they got a water baptism. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they began speaking in other tongues and prophesied. One of the main reasons that a lot of church folk don't talk about the Holy Spirit in this baptism is because they don't want those two things. This baptism must make you weird. And if that's the case, I don't want it. Okay, we'll stay in first grade. Limp your way into heaven. See you there, but I ain't waiting on you. <laughs> Look at another passage, similar situation, Acts chapter 8. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for new believers that they might receive Holy Spirit. Well, I thought they got Holy Spirit at salvation. Apparently, not the form in which they deemed to be absolutely critical and necessary for their walk. Their hearts had been sealed, yes, but the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So they had accepted Christ, been baptized into the faith, sins forgiven, going to heaven, but had not yet received Holy Spirit. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. All right, I could just keep going on and on and on and show you passage after passage where it's pretty clear in Scripture that the disciples of Jesus and the apostles wanted all new believers to have this experience. They wanted to have this encounter with the person of Holy Spirit, and they didn't want them to wait. A lot of people think, it's, well, after I'm, I've served the Lord for a few years, you know, after I get my act together, you know, after I get some things straightened out, I have found that it's impossible to get things straightened out without him. So this is an elementary, everybody say elementary, first grade, this is an elementary doctrine that God wants all believers to experience. I'll show you one more passage, John chapter 20, this is Jesus calls a meeting, actually he didn't call the meeting, the disciples called the meeting, they're all a little bothered by the fact that Jesus has been crucified, they don't know that he's resurrected yet, he's walking around on earth, there's rumors going around, a lot of other dead people have come back to life, should we just ignore that passage, huh, we never talk about that, we never talk about the fact that all the other dead people came back to life and were walking around. What do you do with that? So they called a meeting. They're discussing all of the events. Doors locked. And all of a sudden, Jesus walks through the wall. <laughs> if I were him, I would have done the same thing. Even I like scaring folks. A little morbid, but I enjoy it. I'll hide in the dark, scare my kids. I mean, if I had the capacity to walk through walls and just freak people out, that might be all I do. I don't know. <laughs> On the evening of the first day of the week when the disciples stood together, the doors were locked for fear of Jewish leaders. Jesus came and stood among them. He walked through the wall and said, peace be with you. <laughs> yeah. So after they passed out, they were overjoyed that it was him. And again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. And look at this. With that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now notice what he says. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they are not forgiven. What's he saying here? He says, what I just breathed upon you is the forgiveness of sins. They were the first recipients of salvation. This was the sealing of heart. Well, how do you know this? How do you know that they weren't filled with the Spirit as well? Because he goes on to say, go wait. Why would he say go wait for something else if they already received it at salvation? He says, go, now, now go to Jerusalem, Luke chapter 24, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 1, same story. He appears to them and says, go wait for what my Father has promised. I've given you what I promise. 
Now go wait for what the Father has promised, and I told you about many, many, many times. For not many days from now, you will be filled with power from on high. That's Luke chapter 24, 49. Acts chapter 1, he says the same thing. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised. For John baptized with water, and in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. All right, now listen. I'm about to say something. I'm about to say something. I'm going to go ahead and warn you. I'm about to say something that may be a little shocking, and it may rub your theological cat the wrong way from, from, from tail to head. And if it does challenge your theological cat, go read Scripture. Go read Scripture. Be a good Berean. If you don't know what that means, you need to read more Scripture. <laughs> Here's the statement. The baptism of the Holy Spirit was never intended to be an add-on or icing to the cake or optional experience post-salvation. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is the central, everybody say central, it is the central goal of the Bible for all believers. Central. Well, what about salvation? The primary mission of Jesus for his disciples was the baptism of the Spirit. The baptism of the Spirit. Well, what about the cross? What about salvation? Hey, the cross was necessary. Don't hear me say that it's not. But Jesus didn't come just to die on the cross. He spoke more about what would happen after the cross than he did of the cross itself. The cross was just a critical means of paying for a broken previous covenant. The previous covenant was broken, and his cross had to pay for that broken covenant. It had to atone for all of the unatoned sins. So when he laid down on the cross and said, it is finished, he didn't mean that's all I came to do. No, it is finished, meaning the old covenant has been paid for, and I'm about to usher in a brand new covenant, which is a covenant of Holy Spirit resting upon his children. So when Jesus came and started talking about what was going to be, he saw the cross, but he was looking through the cross. We should all see the cross, but we should also be looking through the cross. The cross is not the end point. The cross is the starting point. That's why he directed most of his training and teaching and direction to his soon-to-be disciples. He would commission them to be filled with power and then deployed to go do what he did. Now, ultimately, there is nothing more important than avoiding hell and going to heaven, embracing and receiving eternal life. But Jesus didn't just offer his life so that you could get out of hell. He offered his life so that you could be filled with power and eradicate hell from every dark place on the face of the earth. He says, I have come to destroy the works of darkness. Jesus said that. I've come to destroy the works of darkness. And you will do what I do. You will destroy works of darkness. Now the problem is traditional theology has minimized the power of God unto salvation to simply saying a prayer and going to church. That is traditional Protestant theology. And traditional Protestant theology has minimized the event of the baptism of the Holy Spirit to a less visible work that just simply happens organically over time, and it makes you a better person. And we use the right words like sanctification. You know, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is like a process of sanctification, just making you a better person over the time. He says, no, 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 it's not what I see. I see him coming in with tongues of fire. It's an event. People are shaken. The scripture that Ross read, this is post that baptism. And these religious people are blown away because of the boldness and the power that these men are exuding. 
They're demonstrating. Everybody say demonstrate. They are demonstrating the power of God unto salvation through miracle signs and wonders. So how did we get so off track? Where did this, where did this get all crazy? I'll tell you, when we stopped seeing that stuff, we created a new theology that made us feel better about our lack. So if I'm not seeing miracle signs and wonders, if I'm not seeing people hop out of grace, if I'm not seeing cancer eradicated, if I'm not seeing that stuff, got one or two choices. I can figure out what's wrong with me, because it ain't on his end, or I can create a the- new theology that makes everybody feel good about themselves. Let's come to church, eat a cupcake, and go home. So instead of teaching what Jesus taught, what he told his disciples to do, to replicate my ministry is what he said, we just create this get out of hell formula, create some teachings about it, create some systems that help people get out of debt and improve their marriage, get a better job. Make them feel better about themselves if they go serve people that are in need. And we go to the house every week. John introduced Jesus. I want you to think about this. This is, this is important. All four Gospels, Jesus is introduced this way. He is the one who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. It's the first mention of him in the, in the gospel. You can look at it. All four times. One who will come after, my, after me. And, and he will save you from your sins. Is that what he says? He will do that. But the way that he introduces him for the first time. Is he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. And that's critical. That's the scripture's way of saying. A first introduction in scripture is always vital. Because it picks the main characteristic of that person. So you read all of it. This is, this is David, son of, and, and, and then it, it, it explains his, his, a man after God's own heart. What's it telling me? His main characteristic is David had a heart of worship. Jesus is the one who baptizes you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Are you with me? I hope so. So that leads us to a question that we probably have all asked at some point. How do I get this? How do I get this? I'm still, I'm still wrestling with this. I don't have... I don't, I'm not 100% on this. I do believe that there are things you can do to posture yourself to receive a measure. But I believe that as time progresses and as you prove yourself to be faithful, that there are other measures and other baptisms that are poured out. I think God will give you a measure of this baptism for where you currently are. But then once you prove yourself to be a person like Peter and John that are going to be bold, God then says, oh boy, we better give them more. Look at these two. They're causing issues. They're stirring things up. We need to give them more. And and every time I take what I'm given and I step out in faith, I think it's often in the step itself that I'm baptized with more. I've also found that there are specific events that I've encountered and experienced in life where God gives a measure of them. And it's always, at least in my experience, it's always after I have humbled myself and positioned myself. And I'm not the one that does it. It's the grace of God that led me to do it. But I humbled myself and came forward or I humbled myself and got in a swimming pool or I humbled myself before the Lord. And God said, okay, you have humbled yourself and I'm about to lift you up with another baptism. So this process is not a formula. I'm the sale that say it's not a formula. I haven't got this figured out. Anybody got God figured out yet? Anybody? Anybody? Okay. I haven't got him figured out, but I do see patterns in scripture that lead me to believe that this is, this is close. All right. N- number one, is there a keyboard player? Eric, come help me. This makes it more holy. <laughs> Number one, remove all barriers. 
Acts chapter 2, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. For, th- for those that say, uh, there, there is a theology, uh, a belief, it's not even a theology, I, it's a belief within some Protestant Christians that the gifts of Holy Spirit have ceased. It's called cessationism. Like he did that, it, it, it's, it's a form of dispensationism which believes that God does things in certain seasons a certain way to accomplish his sovereign will. So back then, he did something very specific through Jesus to establish something, and then he did something very specific in the season of the apostles to establish the word, to write scripture, to prove that this message of Jesus was legit. And then as time progressed, we got away from those things. We don't need those things anymore because we have a Bible and we have the faith. He, he, will, do, he will do again, dispensationalism, he will do again things in Revelation that he once did in Acts to call all saints home in the, in the last days. So that's, God works in segments. He is the same yesterday and today and forever, but just in segments. Does that make sense? No, it doesn't. But anyway, that's what it is. <laughs> So, so what they believe here is that things stop. But what Peter said is this promise is for you, your children. Some versions say you, your children, your children's children, and those who are far off, those are for way in the future. That's what it's saying. So this promise of the Holy Spirit is for everyone who will come after. Jesus inaugurated, he launched a new covenant and also a new season of ministry for all who will come. So one of the barriers that we have sometimes have to remove is just bad theology. Like, you, you have to work really hard to believe that Jesus doesn't do this stuff anymore. you got to work really hard to believe that the Holy Spirit's not doing this stuff anymore. You have to ignore testimonies and count them as false. You have to call people false prophets. You have to rearrange scriptures to make them fit into your theology. Cessationists have to work really, really. They have to work a whole lot harder than we do. Us simple-minded folk that just believe whatever the Bible says. Idiots. Acts chapter 4. That word is idiotos, uneducated, idiotos. The religious looked at them and said, how are these guys walking in boldness and power? They're just a bunch of idiots. I'd much rather be an idiot walking in power than a religious not on a log, not seeing God do anything. Call me an idiot all day long. Some barrier is, you know, I spoke of it earlier. I just don't want to speak in tongues and all of that stuff. Do the research. Like, read. What is it? Why is it useful? Why did God create it? If it's there in Scripture, it has a purpose. And if it's there in Scripture and has a purpose, you probably need it. (laughs) Well, that's just a gift. No, Paul says, I wish that you all speak in tongues. Everybody say all. In the Greek, that means everybody. (laughs) No, I'm just an idiot. But I know what everybody means. If I said, we're fired today, we say everybody gets a brownie. Every single one of you are expecting a brownie on the way out. Not just some of the elect or predestined or chosen. Everybody gets a brownie. It's not hard. This is not hard. So I got to remove barriers. Sometimes that, that's a barrier of pride. I just don't want to come down for prayer. I just want God to do it in my, you know, when I sleep at night or in my bedroom. Okay, well, wait. You're just not desperate enough yet. How else do I receive requests? It says ask. It's number two. Luke chapter 11, Jesus says, you know, you guys are good fathers. He asked some rhetorical questions like, hey, if your, your kids ask for a bread, would you give them a scorpion? No. If he asked for a drink of water, would you give him a snake? Put a little copperhead in his water bottle? It's morbid. No. If you then know how to give good gifts to your kids, though you are evil, sinful, broken, how much more will your Heavenly Father in Heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who accept Christ? Huh? To those who get water baptized? It's not what it says. To those who ask, I think it just automatically happens at some point. No, it's not what it says. To those who ask. Ask. 
some of you will ask for the first time today. And when I asked for the first time, I didn't shake. A tongue of fire did not come and rest upon me. I didn't pass out. But I knew that if my father said, if I ask, I'll receive, that in faith, I just believed I'd received. Now, later, that gift would manifest in different forms. Later, I would begin to pray in tongues. Later, I would receive other gifts. But in that moment, I just believed. He said, ask, you'll receive. In the same way that I didn't feel anything when I got saved, I just knew in my spirit that God had saved me. Because I confessed with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. And I believed in my heart that God raised him from the dead. And he said, if I do that, I'll be saved. So I believe I'll be saved. Some, now, some people have manifestations. Some people, they do stuff. Some stuff, stuff happens. But we see that in Scripture too. People are falling down all in Scripture. Read your Bibles. People are doing weird stuff all in Scripture. The, the main thing is this, this body, this body cannot take the presence and the glory of God. Like things, ugh, things happen. And just because something doesn't happen with your body doesn't mean that you're, you're, you're broken. You're a dud. doesn't mean you're a dud. Everybody just responds differently. Don't, don't, don't even think about that. Just focus on him and ask him. And he faithfully gives. So remove barriers. Ask him. Receive by faith. Without faith it's impossible to please God. Anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly seek. So receive by faith. And what does that mean? Well, if I, re- if I believe I've received by faith, then I'm going to begin behaving as if I've received. If I believe that you've given me a gift, I'm, gonna, I'm going to begin using it. So there's going to be a usage of gifts. There's going to be a stepping out in boldness. There's going to be an operation. There's going to be a new direction. Which leads us to the last thing that I'm going to relate to him daily. I'm going to relate to him daily. This is God's desire for us. Look at 2 Corinthians 13. Stand up. In the message, it says, the Apostle Paul says, this is my desire for you, that you encounter and experience the amazing grace of the Master Jesus Christ, the extravagant love of God the Father, and the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit, that he be with you all. This is what God wants us to all experience. And again, it's not icing on the cake. In, in my opinion, it's not even optional for mature discipleship. I don't think that you can be a mature disciple because of Hebrews chapter 6. I don't think you could be a mature disciple without this baptism. Now, is God going to force that upon anybody? No way. But is it available for you? Absolutely. Absolutely. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And obviously, this is completely voluntary. But if you want to pray it, I encourage you to pray it. If not, it's no big deal. I completely understand. But if you're ready to receive this baptism or you've already received the baptism and you want a greater measure of, every time I get an opportunity to pray this, I pray it. Whenever I'm in a setting, I pray it. Because maybe, just maybe, God's waiting for an opportunity of humility in order to bestow upon me something new. Something new for the season that I'm in. So I want you to close your eyes. And just open your hands. If you feel led, you can come forward. If you feel led, I'm not going to put that on anybody. But if you want to, you can come forward. Just open them as if somebody's going to put a gift. There'll be a part where I ask you to repeat some things. But I just want to stop. I just want to start by reading. Will you stop the keyboard for just a minute? On the day of Pentecost, all the disciples were gathered in one place. And suddenly they heard the sound of a violent blast of wind. It was rushing into the house from out of the heavenly realm. It came. The roar of the wind was so overpowering, it was all anyone could do to bear it. 
Then all at once, a pillar of fire appeared before their eyes. And it separated into tongues of fire that engulfed each one of them. They were all filled and equipped with the Holy Spirit and were inspired to speak in tongues. Empowered by the Spirit to speak in languages that they had never spoken. Father, we thank you for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that happened originally over 2,000 years ago, Pentecost, and it continues to happen daily today. I pray that right now you break all fear, all doubt, remove every barrier, every ounce of bad theology, anything that might be in the way, pride. God, remove it. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you come now and you have your way in this place. Fill those who will ask. Show them how amazing, how holy, how awesome you are. Wherever there are voids, Holy Spirit, from things that have been removed, fill us with yourself in those places. May we never be the same. Now, God, for my friends who are interested in having this baptism or an additional baptism, meet us here. Pray this aloud. Heavenly Father, I am a believer. I am your child. You are my Father. Jesus is my Lord. I believe with all my heart your word is true. And your word says... That if I ask, I will receive the Holy Spirit. So in the name of Jesus, my Lord, I'm asking you to fill me to overflowing with your precious Holy Spirit. Jesus, baptize me in Holy Spirit. Because of your word, I believe that I have received And I thank you. I believe Holy Spirit is within me and now rests upon me. So Holy Spirit, rise up. Rise up. Manifest your presence in my life. I fully expect to experience your presence. To experience your power and to receive your gifts. In Jesus' name, amen.